you should find you like this. Awesome. All right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what that's called, but uh, take three. Like clap. Or telemetry three, source, two, take three. One. <laughs> you should have that, yes. Three, two, one. So cut. <clears throat> yes, like, OK, take three on this API review. <laughs> so are we rolling? Yes, we are. And let me actually share the screen so people can actually see what we are looking at as well. All right, so we have two API reviews today in the first uh, hour or remaining 45 minutes at this point. Um, we will look at uh, iTelemetry source, or telemetry source, I think it's yeah, called. That's right. And then in the second hour, we will talk about a new API to load uh, native DLLs on CoreCLR. All right. Can you scroll up? Now? Um, I, I hopefully. Way like, over. Like yeah, there you go. Okay, great. Uh, awesome. Um, yep. So um, there is a. So this stuff actually exists in the GitHub now, and in fact, there are some links uh, in in this OneNote uh, on how to get to it. But it's yep. where you'd expect it to be. This uh, telemetry source is a, a new API. It lives in its own little DLL system diagnostics tracing telemetry in the Core FX framework, and so uh, it's out there right now on GitHub. Um, so you can take a look at it uh, if you have any questions, detailed questions. Uh, so this is more about the motivation and the rationale behind why it is the way it is. Um, so I resisted making telemetry source uh, quite a bit initially because we already have something called event source that's supposed to do something very much like this, which is to hook up people who want to provide information with the people who want to consume it about what's going on during the execution of a program. Um, unfortunately, um, there are when you when when you abs you look into the details of that abstract model, you find out that there are details that sort of start to collide. And one of the details that col collided in this case is that um, telemetry source uh, was uh, born out of the need for a scenario where we wanted very rich logging. We wanted logging that was as detailed as you could get in a debugger. I mean, there's sort of no place that you don't couldn't go and get the last little bit of information. And it's it's for tools, uh, it's for tools that were meant to be in process and very detailed, much more like a debugger than than a logging system. Um, and so uh, we call that rich telemetry. So this is in support of rich telemetry. Uh, and what hap what what you realize is that event source uh, does allow you to log objects or things, you know, um, data, uh, rich data or richish data, mm -hmm. but not as rich as this, mm -hmm. because we re event source requires that you uh, that you be serializable, because it expects that this data is going to a file, it's going off machine, it's going to the cloud, it's going somewhere, but it's got to leave the process, and because of that, in fact, event source goes to the trouble of doing the serialization for you. And, and that actually gets in the way here, because what I want is I want to log things like HTTP context, which is this huge object that's, you know, goes, you know, has its tendrils everywhere. And, you know, it's certainly not serializable. Um, and, and things like HTTP message with all the headers and so forth. And so I want all that rich information, but I want you to just pass it to me and then I'll figure out what I need uh, is what these tools wanted. And event source just wasn't made for that. It was made for more classic logging, where you've already made the decision of what's important. You've picked things out. And that's one of the interesting uh, design points with this. When you log with telemetry source, you pretty much can just pick up whatever's nearby <laughs> and log it. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of log everything. Everything that's around you, you just sort of log. And then you let the other guy at the other end figure out what he wants and what he doesn't want. Which is cool. Like you can defer that decision, and you never have to like go back and re-instrument and add more things to it. But it has this cost, which is that you can't leave the process. You you and you have to have something in process that will ultimately make those kinds of decisions. And so we could have tried initially. I I, I was thinking about whether you could like make a mode of event source that would do this or whatever. And you could actually probably have made that work, but it probably was more confusing. It was probably uh, uh, you know more complicated because you don't know when you're looking at at this code anymore whether you're in the in process only mode or the out of process mode, and it's better probably just to have two separate APIs so that you know. Now, having said that, we've just created two things when we really only wanted one. Damn it! Um, so what can we do to sort of fix that to the degree that we can? And so we did we did two things. One is that I have a certain amount of guidance. And the guidance, um, it, uh, it, I, 
we need to find a way of publishing it better. Right now it's a OneNote page. We'll figure out where to put it uh, so it's more public. Um, but it's what you'd expect is that you should, uh, uh, the guidance require, I need to talk a, a little bit more about, uh, I'm going to come back to the guidance because uh, I want to talk about some of the features that, that are possible and that will enlighten, you know, that will make it clear why the guidance is the way it is. Makes sense. Um, so the, the, one of the things that you can do is a telemetry source is, is it was set up to be completely, uh, it's what I'll call the fat pipe. The fat pipe meaning the data can be fat, it can be anything, but it, prob but it has this restriction that it can't leave the process. Uh, whereas event source is this thinner pipe, which means that you have to make choices before you even enter the pipe mm -hmm. of what you want, um, but then it can go anywhere. It can go off machine and so on. That's the, the basic difference. And you could imagine a bridge. Uh, so telemetry source right now is a completely independent thing from event source. If you don't have to have any concepts of event source, but uh, telemetry source has a way of doing discovery. And, and we'll see that in just a second, which means that I can make, I can make every telemetry source look like an event source. That is, if I'm listening on event listeners, I might get, uh, I, I, it, normally what you get is you get this list of all event lit, uh, sources in the process. But I can make it also so that that list includes all telemetry sources as well. Mm -hmm. So you can get everything uh, from an event listener. Now, what about this problem of, of fat pipe? Like, okay, I can't stuff these unserializable events into my event listener. What do I do? And the, 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 the simple answer is we do, we do nothing. Uh, initially, which is that we'll just log whatever we can serialize, which means that you might get empty payloads. But we also provided this way that an event listener can say what pieces it wants. And that's what's in this sublink. And we can talk about that as a separate thing. But the idea then is that it can say, you know, in a telemetry listener, you, I'm sorry, telemetry source, you logged an object called foo. I want you to fetch this field out of it, and then that field, and that field out of it, and then put it into this thin pipe, put it into my payload. And by doing that, you can pick and, the, the event listener can pick and choose the things from the fat pipe to sort of suck into and, and go into the, the reduced pipe. Um, suffice it to say, at this point, there is a thing that we think is not too hard to implement, we haven't implemented it yet, that allows telemetry, I'm sorry, event listeners to hook up to telemetry sources. And what's nice about that is that it means that you don't have to choose, you don't have, or you don't have to log both ways. You can log with telemetry source and then people who are listening with event listeners can hook up to it. So that's one way we solve the problem. There's one other way that we solve the problem, which I'll get to later. But let's, let's back up. So before um, you jump yeah. into the APIs, yep. why did you name it telemetry? I think of telemetry yeah. is exactly the opposite of a fat pipe. I know. Um, I want well, so um, I'm open to new. I'm open to names. <laughs> um, the the long and the short of it is is that uh, you know names are always a compromise. We couldn't figure out a better name. Um, Back so, to your definition when you're defining what you think of sources and telemetry. People, people have numbers. people. It's, so I wanted it to call it rich telemetry, uh, which uh, rich telemetry makes you know sense, except that you know it's people will wonder what it is immediately. Uh, I don't know. Um, what makes but, it rich? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What makes it rich? You could say non-serializable telemetry. You know. That's even more descriptive and accurate, um, uh, but you know names are always that one of these issues. The suffix needs to be sourced because it is clearly a peer of. Uh, it, uh, that's right. Source. That's right. So it's just uh, a question of a word that represents rich telemetry, you know, or yes, you know, in process logging or something, you know. Um, just hearing the name around me before we started talking about this, I was thinking this is basically a lower level thing than a mid source, and it's going to be a small, thin layer here, not talking about fat pipes and none. So, so the name is definitely misleading to me. So we have to think about what Okay, yeah. Yeah. reasonable. But let's first, like, maybe look at the. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's find out what it does. Yeah. And, <laughs> because I think and, that's uh, probably informing the uh, name. I, I, am, I am completely open to names, it, uh, you know, modulo. The breaking changeness of that and how yeah. painful that can be. Do you have some but, sample uh, code below, or um, 
so I the sample I ha I do have a little bit of sample code. Um, so there are basically you know okay. So this gets into the design. So we have a telemetry source, and pretty much what you can do with it is write to it. So you can yep. say write telemetry, and the we're using the same mechanism that we used in the uh, write of T um, uh, mechanism in, in event source, which is that you can pass an, an arbitrary object, and you can use um, you can use the uh, C sharp or you know VB um, uh, anonymous types to sort of create any kinds of payload you want. So these, this object will be any parameters that you need. So basically, when you write an event, it has a name and it has a bunch of parameters. The difference between um, write and T in this though is that these parameters don't have to be serialized, right? That's right. That's the key. They're and really by the way, but we do strongly, well, I mean, we do suggest that while he, this thing can be any object, it, it shouldn't be a private object to the component you're in. So you can imagine passing a component that pr has private fields. Yes. That would be bad because you really are exposing this to the external world and taking a contract. Sure. Somebody will care about what the names of those are and so forth. And so it's this this object that you pass better be a public type or it has public fields. Yep. Um, Is there a reason not to make it a T as well? Um, we we could have made it a T, um, but uh, it turns out that that seems to not bias a whole lot. Um, so you, we could have done, done this as a generic with a T. Um, I, I, the same reason we made right of T a T, so, so there can be some more static analysis done to That's it. right. Um, this one doesn't benefit from that uh, as much, but yes, that is, a, that is definitely a design consideration that has ramifications. Um, uh, Stephen Taub mentioned the same thing. And it's, I, I've been trying to keep it, like, generics have their own sort of pain associated with them. And so if they if it's not buying me something, I eliminate it. Um, and, and so I eliminated it here. Okay, so telemetry listeners. Um, the telemetry listener, the, there is some wackiness that you'll probably sort of see here, which is that a telemetry listener inherits from telemetry source. You, so in one model, a telemetry source and a telemetry listener are independent things, and one is the source thing and one is the target thing, and there's not a uh, and they're sort of completely independent. And we could have implemented that as well. Uh, this is again trying for simplicity, which is that um, so ultimately there has to be something that acts like a telemetry source, and it has to communicate with something else that acts as the listener. And the easiest way to implement that is to make them both the same object. So the telemetry listener implements telemetry source, and so you can give it out as a telemetry source. That's how you get your source. And then the listener is also the thing that, that allows you to retrieve events. And the, the basic, um, the basic uh, uh, API for that is the observable. Uh, it, it implements iObservable. So there it is, iObservable. I observable of a key value pair of string and object. So you get an event, an event is two things, a string and a, a payload object. And so I am observing a tuple of those and I use key value pair to represent tuple because I want it to be a struct. And yes. um, we don't have a you know tuple that's a struct otherwise. So so that's the so fundamentally, you know, at, at the most top level thing is that all a telemetry listener is is a telemetry source that also implements the eye observable pattern so that you can you can now subscribe to it. So here is a subscription. Um, there's one more thing though, is that this guy right here, subscribe, is actually the, the implementation of this eye observable pattern. Mm -hmm. There's a but the um, telemetry source wants to be a little bit stronger than a um, an eye observable. Eye observables have no ability to stop the incoming stream or to affect it. They can't sort of say, "Don't don't send me things." Um, and and uh, it turns out that's very valuable for the the clients of telemetry source. These in process guys want to eliminate most events. In fact, only the ones that they sort of care about, which hopefully is a very small number of them, actually should be logged. Um, and so to, to, to implement that, uh, we have that is enabled um, 
API on the source, but how do you get it on the on the listener? And the answer is, is you pass in an extra predicate. Um, and that predicate actually, while it takes a string, which is the name of the event, so based upon the name of the event, you can filter or not filter. In reality, the way the end users are likely to use it is that they are going to use internal hidden state. So in process, they will have a thing that will have noticed that another event happened. Therefore, I know that a particular request is happening. At that point, I want detailed information. So they flip a bit in their internal state that says, I care about the current request. And all of a sudden is enabled now always returns true regardless of what event it is and gets very detailed information for that for that request. And then when that request goes away, it, it flips that bit back. So why is um, the filtering not done in the observer? Like yeah, um, that's a, so um, you could imagine filtering in in the, in the observer, and it's basically there's a significant efficiency gain to doing that. So um, what's the gain? You just go you know on next and pass the yeah okay so the so slide uh, okay so when what, at the very least what happens is when you say write telemetry. Mm -hmm. You have to create a parameters object. That parameters object is likely to be a uh, an anonymous type, which means that you're going to create an object mm -hmm. right. unconditionally. Even if this is off, even if you throw it away, you're going to unconditionally create the object. You're going to populate the object. You're going to send it down the pipe. It's going to go down the pipe to the other side, and then he says, "I don't want it." And so, but if, if on the anyway. other hand you had it, it is not? enabled. Oh, I'm sorry. Why would it not happen when? The predicate that you can check first because before you even call. you don't call right telemetry at all. You just call is enabled, and then you say right telemetry. In fact, the oh, so the, is the guy the guidance is the guidance is is enabled. Um, if you are on a hot path, the sad fact of the matter is you have to always write if is enabled blah. Then do your right. So you what, can't just do a right. I, so, oh, well, I I don't understand. So you can uh, multiple observers can call subscribe. That's right. This is enable what? It's the or. It's it's the or. It's the or. Okay. Therefore, therefore, if two subscribe and one says false, one says true, you it's, still pay the cost of creating the, that's right. the that's object. Right. And that's right. So I wonder whether the wins are well significant the, because it complicates the. Uh, I mean, it's a non-standard subscription API. It would be nice if the yeah. subs if subscribe. Well, you you, you you can use the standard one. Right. I mean, you know, that's up to you. Like, if you don't care about this and you're willing to filter late, go for it, man. It's there. It's fine. So this is this is for the um, and m the this is more about you know keep in mind the people who want this API are people tools people of one form or another. Um, the people, who, however, they need to get people in the framework to put right telemetry in all the right places. And those people are going, why should I put my slow down my hot pads um, with your telemetry when it's off most of the time? So they want, they're looking for something that costs nothing. Uh, and so you need to get as close to nothing as possible. Um, which by the, uh, yeah, telemetry source, by the way, the implementation of telemetry source is highly biased to the case where you expect only one listener, uh, which actually has impact for, um, there's a bunch of guidance that we probably won't be able to get into uh, uh, about how you name these things and how many of them you have. Uh, because what you really want is you want, uh, you, you probably don't want a single telemetry source that has both what I'll call diagnostic events, events that aren't on all the time, versus monitoring events which are on all the time. See, because if you have that, the diagnostic events probably happen all sorts of places and are probably very uh, perf impactful. That would be okay if they're not on all the time, right? If they're only on when you needed them. So at that point, it's fine because I'm only going to have it on when I'm actually debugging. But but you. But if you have the same source needing both, what will happen is that source will be on, it, 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 it is enabled, will be true most of the time. And so all of that thing that I just described about how well this works to filter things out doesn't work anymore. Um, so what you want is you want, at least for your monitoring ones, the things that you're going to be on all the time, 
Well, in that case, you might as well skip is enabled because it's probably going to be on all the time. Um, so why not just skip the test altogether? Just do a write telemetry, but you only do it in places that aren't very expensive to, to, moni you know, to monitor. For those other places that are very hot and therefore very expensive if you monitor them, you're going to have to wrap them in and is enabled, and it better be a different sort. Uh, you know, telemetry source so that it can be off, truly off. Nobody's listening Why to it. Why wouldn't we just push time. those people to a vent source? Um, uh, because they still need the fat pipe. If you're if you're on a hot path, I would never use a fat. Oh pipe. no! They see that's where see <laughs> the people who want this, like the glimpse of the debugger. They want every packet. They want every. They want details, man. They want every it's, last it's little detail. Hot, they want it in the hottest places known to man. Basically. They want the whole key. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they want everything, man. I mean, you know, they, they have no limits to their their desires for data. But it seems um, like if you if you have that pattern, then I think what you want essentially is you want to basically call the right API or the right telemetry API with data that you already have, regardless, right? Like that's right. You are on the on the receiving end, for example, of a, of a request, you basically want to end the HTTP request because you already have that. It doesn't cost you anything. That's right. right. But now let's say you want to plug in, let's say, three or four objects together right, that you don't have. Right. Now, the way to do it would be, ideally, I can define a struct, can just copy these five things on there and then pass right. it in. Right. right now, the API forces me to box that guy because it's right. typed as object. That, that would be the biggest advantage to changing To make that T, yes. Um, but then the idea would be I can always basically construct you know the set of things I want to log. I can even give them a name, and then I have somebody else in the system to say, given that event, do you want to do anything with that data? And then I think the the, the question at that point becomes, does as does is enabled buy you anything? Because another way to do it then you can just pass in an object that is lazy, for example, and you can always pass in that object. Well, we're trying then, we're trying to keep the overhead low where creating like the. If you've allocated an object, you're too expensive. No, but that's what I'm saying. You can always create a struct that doesn't cost you anything to allocate. Uh, even and structs then, cost you something, but I, I'm, I'm with you. And that, then you can just say, expensive. you know, this guy has a bunch of properties. You also end up initializing all the fields of that struct. So, I mean, it's it's not free. It's, it, you could call um, also this API multiple times instead of creating a struct. Like that's true. Three times. That's true. Three well, that's not necessarily. Uh, well, usually, that's less energy. efficient. Uh, well, it's also like it's harder to correlate. It's also pain, more painful on the other end. Yeah. Because um, you end up making up some sort of state machine to sort of gather, bundle it back together again. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, so let's say you want to con control, for example, the current thread and. Uh, Let's say, like the request, right? If you want to bundle both of them as one atomic unit, now but, would you? Do that? But anytime you deviate from the quote, obvious solution, like the solution that's, you know, I have a bunch of data, I would like to log it. I happen to have three things, I'd like to log the three things. Whenever you deviate from that, there's a pretty good chance it won't work, you know, in practice because people won't follow that advice. There, you know what I mean? Like any guidance, if if I've learned anything in this space, is that. It's in, it's hurting cats. Like there are just so many people, and they have different. And so, if even something that seems moderately simple from an architect's point of view, it's really hard to get everyone to do that, even quasi uniformly. So, it ideally, this is stuff, and that's why I hate this problem that we have, which is because this allocates an object and is moderately expensive. I really do need to say I need to do an is enable check before any. You know, should we provide? The API that does that for them. That's the yeah. problem is that we can't because in order to provide that API, I need they have to allocate the test. Uh, uh, yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, it's the fact that I'm setting up the parameters which is costing me the, the cost. And so, yeah. I, I, if we had if we had la if C sharp had a lazy function or a macro or something like that, we could do what what you described. We just don't have it. Um, so. Um, Let's but, see. Uh, so another uh, question. So, do you have a list of all the listeners? Uh, okay. So I haven't talked about one more thing. So uh, so far I've talked about telemetry listeners. Let's just walk through the APIs. There's a a constructor which you give telemetry listeners have a name, and it turns out that's quite handy for a number of reasons. But we'll get to that in just a second. Um, you. 
telemetry listeners have explicit dispose. So, uh, you know, you have to dispose them to sort of stop listening. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they have, and then you can fetch the name that you've constructed. Two string is just for debugging, and you can subscribe. So that's pretty much it. So the only other interesting thing here is uh, is where do you go? There's also I lost it. Oh, there's the old listener. Where, where's the old listeners? Don't 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 discovery. Yeah. Ah, here we go. Okay, this is the m most interesting one, which is that whenever you create one of these things, it gets put on a list, um, and um, we basically have an eye observable so that you can. Um, you can get the list of all listeners, whether no matter when you came in the process. So in other words, there might be have been several listeners that have been created, and then you code, your code gets the uh, subs, you know start this or subscribe to all listeners. What you will get is you will get a replay of everything that has happened up to that point. So every listener. So so the the invariant here is that when you ask for all listeners, you will get a callback for every listener, past or present. That has ever existed, uh, and what that does is it lets you subscribe to them or not. It, 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 we have a very similar kind of thing in event source, uh, which is that every time an event source gets created, the all the listeners get to know that a new one got created, and that way you can um, uh, you can subscribe if you want to or not. You can decide to subscribe, um, and this is part of the reason why we made it an explicit dispose. You you could have done it with weak handles and things. Um, and, and made it all work, but this is ma this makes telemetry listener a little bit heavier in the sense that you know there really is this list of all listeners um, that lets you discover them, but it also um, you know makes the implementation a little bit more complicated. So a question: um, Why don't I think you told me about this in the past, but I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you subscribe to sources, not to listeners? Why why don't we have a similar model that we have for? Uh, you know, trace source where uh, you hook up listeners to sources. Um, because it seems like now we have two types, trace source and trace listener, but they are kind of both sources. And you subscribe yeah. to yeah. them using uh, I observable, and the things that subscribe are just observers. That's right. So, why do we have two types, telemetry source and listener? Why not one type? Um, well, so um, you could do that, I suppose. Um, so all that would mean is that you just get rid of this class and mm -hmm. it just becomes yeah. part of this class, which is which is okay. Um, it's the only thing that's a little bit wonky about that is that um, is that there there is a certain value in in the abstraction. Like this is the only stuff that a producer needs to know about. This is stuff that a consumer needs to know about, but there's stuff in a source that you know that 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 the source doesn't need to know about. And this and that all we're that's what we're doing effectively. You know, yours is saying, "Hey, why not just put this inside this guy?" And the only value to that is that we have something called a source, which is just a piece of a listener that lets you know that I'm only supposed to be creating events. I'm not supposed to be listening to them. Um, if we think that's not that valuable, then we can make it even simpler by just pulling this into here and calling it a day. Um, uh, it, do you ever expect anybody to subclass and derive from the listener itself? I'm sorry? Do you ever expect anybody to derive from the listener? Uh, this listener? Yep. No, not really. So we can seal it. Yeah, we probably should seal it. So, um, I can't think of a reason but why. But the source you obviously explain. Oh, actually, um, no, I remember now. Um, OK, so you know, the people that I was interacting with in the design of this are the ASP.NET people. And they love interfaces. So the idea that this isn't I telemetry source and blah, 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 blah. Um, and I said, uh, um, you have to show me why you need an interface. To me, the interfaces are more complicated. They as Christoph mentions you don't get to version them as well because they're not, you know, you can't add default new implementations. Uh, and so you have to show me why, you know, the, uh, the interface is better. But one of the things, one of the scenarios that they said is they want to do mocking. 
So they want to be able to say, I have a telemetry listener that does whatever and, and mocks it, doesn't go to where it would normally go, it goes somewhere else, does their own thing for testing and so forth. So you know, you'll notice that every interesting method in here is, um, is virtual. Uh, and so it allows you to subclass this, override everything you want, and do that mocking. And it gives you the flavor of an interface without being an interface, but we still do get this uh, better versioning capability that interfaces don't have. So uh, there are lots of compromises here. You know, you could quibble about all of these design decisions. So the separation between source and listener now I understand, but it seems like it's not complete because you can, it isn't. Um, you can basically downcast to listener and then yeah. for example, dispose it. That's right. Uh, it's not source, complete. The source was like, you know, it's completely safe to give source to third party code right. because they cannot hurt the system. That's the, right. the only thing that they can do is not write Listen. telemetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think maybe that's valuable given that they can downcast and dispose. It's kind of well, it's it, you're right that it's not it's not meant to be a security feature. Um, in, in general, you have, you know, uh, this is more about. Um, it's more about uh, trying to lead people to the right place, like they, that their IntelliSense, you know, you know, works yeah. properly. So in fact, this default source, <laughs> actually I left the implementation in here, all it does is call the default listener, because after all, a listener is a source, and in fact, the default uh, source is, you know, goes to the default listener, and, and so this is just a way of removing a little bit of type information so that you are a little bit led down the right path of only using these two APIs. Um, and, you know, it is a judgment call whether that's valuable enough. Um, what do you not, do with the default one, by the way? You, okay, so you can't so, actually enable or disable anything. So, the, okay, the default listener, that, that's an interesting, that's an interesting design point as well. Uh, to the, to the, at the, this instant, I'm not sure anyone is using the default listener or, and, and the default source. Although the intent was, the original intent of the default listener was, if you have sort of low volume telemetry, uh, then you can send it to the, the default and there'd be one of them. Um, but, and I think that might still be a useful scenario, but it's not completely clear to me that it's, it's a useful scenario. And the reason is, is because as I mentioned before, is that if you listen to, and you know, if you even have one subscriber, uh, you you're on, right? As far as is enabled is concerned, so you really there's a half decent chance that we'll want to be more fine grained in this. We'll want several listeners, and and it's not clear that what this global one will be used for. But I will say that we made the opposite choice with event source, and people hate it, hate us for it which is that we sort of didn't provide a default, like you have to make a new one and you know there's no simple one. And because of that, you can't just write something that, that you know. Well, originally we didn't have a generic write anyways. You always had to that, override your own write. Well, way early in event source, we actually did have a write string that okay. sort of did that. But, um, but, but then we took it out uh, because we were on this, let's just be pure and, and, and as simple as possible. And so, you know, removing these two things, I don't think is such a bad idea. Um, originally, we thought that that most things in the um, in the framework might use the default listener. That was the sort of framework's source. Like, if you cared about that, um, it's there's a half decent chance that in practice, what will happen is is that every component will have its own. Um, so that you can, you know, keep them separated and not have to listen to everything just because you want one thing. But inside um, BCL, so like let's say networking stack, should networking stack create their own? Right now, they've actually asked me my advice on that particular, that exactly that, and I said they probably need at least one and maybe more. And then, um, then the now they they are they're in the case where. Their efficiency concerns are, are extreme, yeah, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are probably the poster child of I can't, you know, I can't have any sort of overhead um, in that uh, unless you could justify it. Um, so, 
that's part of the reason why they're going to have multiple sources. This one is meant for light duty things. Like if you're logging things, you know, you know, just a few times a second, you can, who cares if even 10 other people did that and you ended up with a few other things that you have to filter out. No one really cares. Um, it's probably fine. So this one is a convenience. I, I could, I could certainly imagine tossing it. Uh, and I don't have a killer app for it at the, Originally, we thought everybody would use it inside the framework, but that's turning out probably not to be true. It doesn't seem uh, very useful given that you can't configure it or anything with like you can't enable the disable. Sure, you can. How? How do you get a hold of the default source and turn it enable or disable on something? I'm sorry. To, well, you have a default listener, which the default source goes to. I'm not sure what your question is. So then, how do you go and you en enable disable it? Uh, you subscribe to it, and then you pass your credit card again. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, uh, I mean, the, the other thing that happened was early on, we didn't have this guy either. So this was the way to discover. Um, but, uh, but now we pretty much, you could get at anybody. Uh, and you can find if, you know, yeah, it, it just boils down to um, if we believe that every new component should be having its own event source that it created, well then each component will maybe make one of these and, and that's what we expect to have happen. If we believe that some components aren't worth that, like you know they're just not interesting enough in themselves and we need another place to put these sort of miscellaneous, then this does have value. And I, and I don't know whether that's true or not, but given that we can be agile about it, I don't have a problem you know, hiding it and then later we can expose it if we find it's valuable. Um, so, um, uh, question about the all listeners: Why yeah. did you choose to go with up exposing a high observable there? Yeah. Well, so we had this so versus what? Like, what's the alternative? A collection of them or whatever. Yeah. So the the problem is is that you need to support both everything in the past and everything into the future. Um, so, in other words, you really need to. You yeah. just need the list of all current listeners, right? Well, what happens when new listeners come online? So, so, so again, imagine a tool. I get, I, I, I start up sometime in the beginning, like when my class, when my module gets loaded by some mechanism, some amount of code in the framework has already run, and then, then I run, and then some amount of code later is run, and other people add listeners, and I want to see everything. Uh, and so what you want to say is, well, I want the list of everything that happened before me. And then I also want the, the, I want to be notified every time a new one comes online so that I can subscribe to it immediately before. Can you use a bidding for this? With a, a so in fact, the original, the original uh, version of this, we, we used events. And the problem was, um, is that events don't really work that well. Um, so the big difference between events and observables is observables have a real live um, li um, lifetime model. There really is a, I, I am done with you, um, you know, that you can now stop listening, you know, and, and so forth, because observables have the unsubscribe and they also have the end method that sort of says, I will never send you another uh, event down the stream. And normal events don't have that. And what you find out is that if you don't have those things, it gets ugly. Um, and so when we found, we, so in response to those ugly implementation details, we said, oh, we really have an architectural problem here. And they said, well, that's what I observables were meant to solve, was to solve those kinds of things. Why not just make it an I observable and call it a day? And I actually like that solution. It's, um, I just think the coding pattern is a little bit wonky. It is a little wonky. I, I must admit that I am Zerbo, I'm, I'm conflicted about because it's heavy. Like when you actually use it in practice, it's heavy. Um, although I talked with Christoph about this, what we would really like to do is pull out some of the helpers that were, are in the reactive framework today and put them in their own little thing. Because there are a few little reactive framework things that let you basically, if I don't care about all that lifetime crap, all I want to do is give you an, an, an action and call it a day. Well, there's a thing in Reactive Framework that does that. It takes an action and gives you back an observable. And that's what you just you know, plug one of those things in and now it looks beautiful again. It's, it's, it's perfect. So arguably that should be the solution. And now that's just a question of, okay, how exactly do we 
like deploy that. Um, also, so implementing observables is very hard. Implementing observers is relatively not hard. easy. Yeah. And to use this API, you just need to implement an observer. observer. That's true. I know, but it's just a matter of how you. Yeah. Uh, so I, someone, it, someone. The thing about it is that no one has told me I observer or I observable is bad. Like it was a mistake. Like we could have done it in this much simpler way. And why the hell didn't we do it in this much simpler way? It's just that the thing that you actually want to do is more complicated than you realized. And so there is complexity there. And you can hide some of that complexity with these shortcuts. And so we should just, you know, do the shortcuts. And that seems like the right answer. Um, and I, so I, this guy I, should follow suit and use I. I just worry a little bit that we're introducing a sort of new paradigm. We, have, we don't have well, a lot okay, of Well, okay. Another thing that's important about this, this API is really for like 10 people in the universe. Like, you know, it's, it's not, you know, Mort's you don't, API. You don't expect uh, every single app to be creating a volunteer listener or getting the phone running? No. <laughs> I would hope not. I, uh, um, so I expect, I expect, frankly, tools like Glimpse and Visual Studio to use this API directly. That's pretty much it. And then other people might get at the same things through event source through this bridge that I mentioned earlier, that you can get at anything that I log with a telemetry listener from an event source and then, you know, back you it up. You expect a there. lot more people to be using telemetry source, obviously, right? The, the log the data. Is that every yeah, we actually expect modest use. I mean, we expect the, uh, I expect this to be only used mostly in the framework because tools, I mean, tools like Visual Studio or Glimpse or these other things, what they really care about mostly is, is, is instrumentation in the framework that lights up regardless of what you wrote in your app. They don't really care about your events much, uh, and it requires them to come up with a, uh, you know, a model that lets you describe what your events are and let them display and blah blah blah. It's complexity, and so in their tool, and so they're probably not going to do that. Um, and so this, I expect telemetry source mostly to only be used in the framework. Although it could be used other places, but I expect it only to be used in the framework. I expect telemetry listeners to be used by a handful on one hand tools, and pretty much that's it. Well, you said that each component will create their own telemetry listener. That's right. Uh, so, so, they, I, well, so I meant that, that, that's that's the use. They're really creating their own telemetry source. It's just it's true they're creating a limit listener, but all they're trying to do is they want to be able to log events. Mm -hmm. And the way you have to do yeah, that is you have to make up. Yeah. So um, there is no question that there's a little bit of wonkiness about the name. Um, so um, and the fact that this inherits from that. I mean, uh, people get confused. There's no question. And um, do we have any other ideas for names? Uh, I mean. Uh, Christoph and I talked about this, and I said, you know, uh, and I'm still open. I, I don't really care that much, but but um, I can't think of anything that was. I, I did like spend 15, 20 minutes thinking about alternatives, and and could not come up with something better uh, that I liked a lot better. Rich telemetry is sort of the, the closest thing so I got. I, to. I once I mentioned uh, we should consider. Something like diagnostics. I was thinking diagnostic or diagnostic uh, tools as well. So but it's yeah. such a generic name. That's why maybe it's okay. It basically tool diagnostic source is what I was thinking because if you're talking purely about the tooling aspect, is there's only people. It kind yeah. of identifies who should be looking at using it. Diagnostic. Uh, so or debug source, diagnostic source. I, I I don't have a problem with that. I mean, certainly people. I know that we've gotten feedback that sort of telemetry is sort of, people think monitoring. They think lightweight, they don't think sort of heavier. So it actually is an easier sell if, if it were named diagnostic source or, or um, if you really think it is about tool, just add a name tool and tool diagnostic source. I don't know. I don't. Uh, while it, I don't expect it to be used by anything else but besides tools, I, I also don't. I, I feel like it. It doesn't. Uh, it makes me one. Uh, 
know, it would be nice if the name it. was like a peer of event source and event source is towards. I feel like it, there's something nice about this being towards two instead of three. Oh, <laughs> I made a lot of the reasons. Mainly only used by tools. There we go. Tools too. By the way, what namespace is this going in? It's in system it's like diagnostics, diagnostics or tracing, or diagnostics. telemetry. Yeah. So we want to change tools. the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's in the system diagnostic tracing, then what about this tool source? Or if you want to identify so tool source, source implies that it's a source of tools. It, yeah, uh, that, that's a bit weird. Sure. I wonder, like from an API standpoint, like what what does consumption look like in Glimpse? So when the guy showed me some things that happen in Glimpse, is that they basically because once you make the object a T, the, the interaction model becomes very different, right? Because now you have to subscribe to a generic T, right? That's right. So, that, but I think like if you look at how Glimpse, I think uses that is they, they don't subscribe to any event, right? You usually subscribe to specific events. Oh, uh, okay. So I, I know quite a bit about what's going on there. So um, what they expect to have happen, um, first of all, Glimpse has a major problem, which is that they actually don't want to use specific T's okay. because they don't want to take the, the problem is, is that they want to make believe that their DLL is, you know, the Glimpse tool DLL, mm -hmm. and it has no dependencies on any other DLLs that it won't drag in other DLL dependencies. Um, and yet the tool wants to have support for HTTP, blah, 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 all these different sort of very detailed okay. things. And so they actually, the, the first version of their version of this thing basically used reflection. So they take those objects, they reflect over them, and basically copy out the pieces that they need. That's how it works. So they use the is enable to only get the pieces that they want, and then, and then they use reflection, a fairly heavy, uh, expensive thing to do to fetch it. And frankly, whenever somebody uses a, um, an anonymous type, to, to log the event, you're screwed. You have to use reflection. Yes. There is no static type that you can point at and say it's that. Um, now, it's true that in some cases, they might want to do what you said. Like, I am willing to do for HTTP message, maybe I'm I, you know I'm willing to take a dependency on that because, but they don't want to take a dependency, for, for example, they don't want to take a dependency on ADO.net because they don't want to be the guys who drag in ADO.net even though their tool wants to be able to like do everything possible about digging into ADO.net. They do not want to take a static dependency on it. Um, so they're they're already in the I'm using reflection case. But wouldn't it be um, valuable, like if right telemetry was of T, um, you could use a struct. Yeah, It would not box when you call it. That's true. Now inside you check whether it's enabled. If it's not enabled, you exit. That's right. Uh, when it's enabled, then you box. But I assume that if you know if the pipeline is enabled, the cost of boxing is not that. That's right. You. It's, it's probably only when uh, you, I agree when with everything disabled. you said. That's true. Um, because it seems to be that once once you pause on the event, so, some heavyweight mechanisms happening. Right? So the boxing is there's the a couple things. Um, is that the first thing is that you can use a struct. A struct is significantly harder to use le le lexically because we don't have. We don't have anonymous types for structs. We have anonymous types for classes, which means that somebody has to declare a new class and blah, blah, blah. And that's like a quantum leap of, of extra goo that people have to write that they didn't have to write before. And so it's not clear that anyone will use it. Um, and then even if even though you're not allocating, it's true that you're, you're filling in several fields and, and you're allocating something on the stack and you're pushing a eight byte, you know, eight D word thing onto the stack. I mean, it's not free. Um, you know, it's cheaper, but it's not free. So, you know, it's an interesting design thing to think about. This is this is a compromise. There's no question there are a bunch of compromises in this thing. And one of them is, is that realistically people are going to use anonymous types. So now it's okay to use an anonymous type as long as it's on. And the problem with that is that that's what forced this. And you, you almost needed this anyway, because it turns out there are enough cases in which 
you just don't have the objects lying around. You needed to do something, fetch them out, do something yeah. expensive in order to get the information. So you absolutely needed this API. At this point, we just say use it every time you're on a hot path, regardless of whether this was easy or hard to make up uh, the arguments. Um, so yeah. one like quick also naming comments. I kind of don't like the name parameters. Okay. Because uh, first we call them parts. I know. Uh, in a lot of places, not parameters. I actually, I'm pretty sure I changed it. Two parameters on your suggestion. Oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was called arguments before, and you said don't call it arguments; we call them parameters. And so I said, okay, oh, fine. I, but but on naming, right. you know, I just wanted to converge. <laughs> like you know, the problem with names is that you get ten people, you can get ten answers, right? Um, it's very I would, easy. so anyway. One is that it's you know parameters, and to me they are arcs, not parameters. I would also say they are secondly, it's singular. a plural, yeah. and it's on the object. And yeah, yeah, although we really do expect, it is plural because we really do expect you to use anonymous types. No, yeah, but they're still singular. Right? They may have I, get it. I get it, but if I call it parameter, it, it it's less obvious that we really do expect you to use an anonymous type to pass multiple. Well, but if you say parameters, but again, I, I, I don't care. Like names, I, I don't care. If we diagnostic source, we just call it diagnostic value or something like that. Um, you can write diagnostic. You, you know can. when you when you uh, observe it, you get key value pair, and the, yeah. the, the properties are called key and value. I yeah. wonder whether we should just like go with it. call it value because key basically value. these things correspond to the key value. I don't have a problem with calling it value. Uh, I don't have a problem with calling it values, yeah. uh, but I, mean, I don't care. I think like what happens if people actually pause in an array? It's not the meaningful happening. Probably not, right? I'm sorry. If somebody passes an array or a collection of something, probably you can nothing do meaningful. That. But probably nothing meaningful happens, right? Because I mean, well, we just pass it through, so it's all it's a contract to the other the side the guy on the other side. He gets to just look at it. So what we expect to have happen is that people who subscribe to these things they'll take this object and they'll either use reflection on it immediately, saying what are you and and what fields do you have and like pluck fields out of it and so on, do that sort of heavy lifting. Or they're going to cast it to particular types that they think are hot. So they'll cast it to HTTP context or whatever. And then if that succeeds, they immediately have a HTTP context and then they don't have to do the reflection on the rest of it. Either way, it's going to be, you know, a even in the cast, if you have several of those casts, it'll add up to something. And the reflection will be even more expensive. Um, and so what we've said in the guidance is that. You should assume that when it's on, it's moderately expensive. So it better be the case that either you don't do it very often, like under 100 times a second, or you're not, you don't really use this, or, or you, you have to be very careful um, about what you pass. So um, it's, it's a problem. Like, there's no ideal solution here. Because um, you really do want the cost to be zero. Okay, uh, I'm sure we, since we started late, I can probably cheat and get away with using a little bit of the extra, the, the second hour, but it feels like, you know, we should at least wrap up with action items or something like this. Um, as I mentioned, there are people who are using this and have taken a dependency on it. So we shouldn't willy nilly change names unless we really think it's a good idea and we're willing to like push it through and make sure that everyone, you know, does it. Um, it's, it's, but you know, if we really I feel think it's strongly that the formatting just does not. Okay. Right. So if you want to change it to something else, that's fine. I just need to, so, to, we so need to something. converge on it. We were converging on diagnostic. It's not only diagnostic source is okay by me. Actually, I don't. I, I actually think that it fits better with the guidance. The guidance that I wrote up is about this better not be on all the time. And diagnostics does give this idea that it's not on all the time. Um, so I what about debug the source, although I think we already have one of those. Um, maybe not. I mean, uh, debug and diagnostics is sort of similar ish. Um, so if we call it diagnostics, in proc source, source. Um, what is the method thing going to be? Right? Diagnostic value or diagnostic? It can be just right, by the way. Oh, um, okay. We could call it right value. We could. Um, Could it be just right? So in the past, we when we talked about it, 
we we had to add a suffix because we had a we didn't a, we, we, we didn't need to add a suffix, but but the the because you could just make this right and it'll work. Although there was a concern that um, that there might be collisions with other things that use right as their but that was but I don't think I don't think that was a real thing. Like we yeah. thought about it, but I don't think we actually came up with something that's real. Um, I'll tell you though that it would be nice if this was a noun that represented the thing that was being logged. That's what we're doing with the you know with all the other things. And so originally telemetry, while you could say it's a bad word for it, what you want to say is a rich data item, right? That's what we want is a noun that represents rich data item. Uh, that's short, right? That's pretty much what we want Unfortunately, there. Unfortunately, data source is a little big. That's it, yeah. So, well, um, I was thinking event. <laughs> event. Because that's pretty much what we have, right? Events are things that have a payload and do something yeah. with them, right? Um, so, rich event or whatever. Um, rich event source wouldn't bother me, actually. It, it sort of tells you exactly what the relationship is between event source and this thing. I mean, what's the difference? Why does this exist? Well, this one has rich events in it, rich payloads, and the other one doesn't. Um, um, I mean, diagnostic event source wouldn't be bad either, right? Diagnostic's not too bad. I agree. I wouldn't have a problem with that. I like that because um, when people people always come, when we introduce this to people, people sort of complain that telemetry isn't what I thought. You know, I have to explain what telemetry means, and they always say, "Oh, that's not what I thought it meant," and. I don't want you know that's an uphill battle. Like that's every right. I think new that's person, why I think the name needs to come from um, change from telemetry. Yeah. Um, I mean, the nice thing is once you call the diagnostic event source, you can just call this guy right event. And it would make sense. You already conveyed the meaning that it's rich by the fact that it's on diagnostic event source, not event source. Or just right. Or just right. Yeah, the only trouble that's what we did with uh, yeah, I can live with that. diagnostic event sources that makes it seems like it's tied to event source, which is not. I'm fine with diagnostic source too. I mean, that's then we just call it right. That works. Yeah, because diagnostic event source may people may think this. Yeah, that's why it's I, I would have expected an inherent relationship there. Yeah. So, any other action items? And well, I want to I want to understand. We're really going to change it. We're really going to change it to diagnostics. I mean, if like we're going to change it. I need a name. <laughs> And you know, I, it can't change again. Okay, so this is it, man. Uh, I thought I was through. Uh, I did a similar thing. I polled some people a month ago, and and we came up with telemetry. We we, we debated it a bunch, and then we came up with this name. I said, okay, great. Uh, I just don't want it. You know, uh, the the further along it goes, the harder it becomes. Okay. Any other action items? So, and then changing this to just right, I don't have a problem with that either. And then the parameters, I would change at least the last one to value. Yeah, I, I, agree think that. I feel kind of strong. Okay, okay and that's the fine. First one, maybe we should change to. Well, it shouldn't be called telemetry name anymore. Yeah. Key and value seems fine with that space. Yep. They're going to be called I, everywhere else. I think that's probably not a bad idea. Even that then you use key value pair on the yep. other side. It will make it clear what's what the clearer what's Yeah. The, I guess. I mean, the thing about it is, that if I think about it, in, while it's true that it'll be called key on the other side, um, if if you if you name it key up here, I'll tell you, key doesn't. If you named it name, I would I, I would say, oh well, that's my name. That's the name of this data item that I'm about to send, and it makes sense. If you named it key, I would wonder if there's some weird semantics that I don't understand. Uh, about what this string means, like you know, um, but again, it's a minor thing. So, but the same could be said on the other side too. Like, yeah, the, the, I would say of the two, um, yeah, on the other side, it's a little bit more clear that you're just using key value pair as a. I, I don't know. Yeah. For me, it was sort of obvious that we were just using it as a tuple. Um, it's not but, clear that you're not backing it with some dictionary behind the scenes still or something. Yes, that's true. But again, it's a key. So, of, of, the key is the name. Yes, yeah, so like, but I, is, is that mean? The key is a more generic term, like a name. I don't know. That's like, actually a good question. Is that unique? If you can't have conflicting names, right? They have to be. A so key. we don't enforce that. But yes, it would be. It would be. Um, it would probably cause your consumer problems if you reuse the name. 
um, to have structurally different payloads. But there's nothing that prevents that. We could also call it ID. ID is fine. Um, and then we could consider, instead of using key value pair, just have a nested struct in the listener. If we worry about the yeah. mismatch, but probably not worth it. So you would rename uh, basically the key to ID? I can live with the that. The main thing that I find strange is that on one side it's called it yeah. can be called something yeah. else than on the other. What, what's also but the, the only the, what mitigates that a little bit is it's actually pretty rare that somebody writes both. You usually write a source or you write a listener mostly. Um, so you actually aren't in the position of noticing that that anomaly usually. Um, but I, again, I don't. I, I, I generally stay out of naming. Um, uh, after a point. I don't think it would be a bad suggestion though. Like we could just use like event name and then we can just have, I don't know, uh, diagnostic event as a nested struct and the telemetry listener and call one field event, yeah. name the other one value. That would work. Wouldn't be terrible experience wise. Could even be a top level type, it doesn't have to be nested. Honestly, I think the best compromise is to just rename the parameter to key, key and value. Or diagnostic key, if you want. I don't have a problem with key and value. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At some point, you just have to move on. But be clear that we're not changing it again. I said that before, but anyway. Um, all right. All right. Now it's recorded what we said. Yes. So you know, <laughs> if we change our mind, we can. <laughs> All right. I guess. Are we done then? I think we are. All right. Did you add a note that uh, implement this post button properly? If not, no, I was thinking the same thing. Person. Yes. I'm sorry. What was that? You need to implement the post button correctly on the listener if you're not going to seal it. You gotta have the dispose true pattern kind of thing so the your subclasses can do it. Yeah. But I thought we said we would seal it. You said if there are scenarios no. where they don't want to seal it. Can't seal it. Oh. <clears throat> that was minor, so I didn't know what to do. Did we make a decision about whether or not the default is going to stay there or not? It's default. Oh, the yeah. static default source in those things. Um, I think we were leaning towards you or leaning towards yeah, just like not having them. That we need them. That we, that we mean them. Um, so the dispose bool pattern was mainly invented for two things. One is when we define the Right. The second one was for uh, managed plus plus for the destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, are the so like we don't use finalizers anymore, correct? We use yeah, safe, safe handles. handles. And then many C plus plus team still is using these things. Let's click that and just separate work out yes. of to discuss what yep. our suggestions for this part about but we should be consistently with the pattern for now. Yes. Until we don't clear All right. So then let's move on to the other side. There are also notes that we'll send notes later once the meeting is over. All right, so let me try to look for multiple screens again. And there's that guy. All right. All right, so my understanding is that that's basically our way to support uh, load library uh, in a meaningful way. So who of you wants to give a brief overview of why we put it on the semi node context and what that means? Yeah, I can give an overview. Um, so basically, assembly load context is provided as a way to um, load uh, assemblies and unmanaged uh, DLLs uh, in a custom fashion uh, by controlling where they're loaded from, uh, the name with which they're loaded and such. So right now, we already have the load unmanaged DLL that people can override and use pinvoke to actually load the DLL and then give us a, a system handle to the library. Um, and then we would then track its lifetime and so on. Um, but like uh, one, one user of this is DNX. Mm -hmm. They want to um, provide all the unmanaged DLLs, 
<coughs> excuse me, through NuGet, mm -hmm. and then they want to be able to give um, uh, certain app-specific paths that override the default search orders, um, so they can load them easily and uh, return them. Um, the problem for them is they have to write, uh, they have to do um, native or uh, apps or uh, platform-specific code um, to load these libraries and. The DL open is um, a little of a pain to implement because, first of all, you need uh, uh, platform detection. Mm -hmm. um, you need to do error handling um, uh, for all the different cases where they can error out. Yep. Um, and um, they currently exist in different uh, libraries. So on uh, <coughs> on Linux and Mac, they're in uh, libc, I think. And on FreeBSD, they're in libdl. Um, so they have to handle those uh, issues as well. So the idea was to provide a load unmanaged DLL from path, which basically gives the user um, the ability to provide us an absolute path. Um, and we will take care of all the platform invoke stuff, uh, including error handling. Uh, we load the DLL. We throw an exception in case it fails to load for some reason or another. Um, and we return the system handle from the function. I see. So it would look like that instead. Uh, it's actually one. Yeah, that's the use of how it's going to be used. And below is the API, the bottom line there. Yeah, so basically, that's the code they write today. Yeah. We don't have that API. That would be uh, how it would look like if they had the API. Right. And then this is basically the resulting surface area. No, but one thing to note is if somebody wants to use, say, DL open with some custom flags, they can still do that using the platform specific code. So this is, this is basically just a helper for the common case yep. where people just want to use the default flags. Yes. And uh, they just want to customize the path. Why isn't this just a static API somewhere outside of load context? How does it connect to load context? So what if, we do somebody loading? Uh, you know, the, the idea is that eventually, if we uh, support the uh, 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 the unloadable assemblies, right, we might want to uh, consider keeping track of what we loaded and then unload it. In most okay. cases, like in the VMX scenario, are they trying to, they want to give the path that is next to the assembly that, that is loaded, right? But they want association type to uh, the loaded managed assembly and then the, the, like from what I've seen in other scenarios, they put the unmanaged assembly next to the managed assembly, and they expect to just get the path of the assembly and load the, the native assembly from that. So sure. the path they pass back in this case would be relative to the assembly. Sure. Is the run, is the VM when they try to do like a interrupt code going to call back through this to find the path of the native DLS for the import DLL imports or anything like that? Yes, but it, it is, but it, it's like the DL uh, import. Okay, right. so there is needs to be a hook back from that, so they have a, something to hook on. Okay. So it's not just a static helper of like do a load library for me um, on the platform. It's actually now also the VM is looking back and find the, the DL to using this program. No, the, the way the workflow, it, the flow is that the VM calls the load unmanaged DLL. That's the virtual mm -hmm. method that you can override, and you can choose Where you in your to override. To call this book to make the other from path. And the, the handle itself is going to be associated with the assembly load context. Okay. But the callback is the reason why it's in the context, which makes sense to me. So. Yeah, because you create, you have to be in your own universe, right? Yeah. No, that makes sense. But I said, so one thing I still don't understand custom assembly load context class is an internal class. That we're gonna ship, or it's something that we expect people to. That's write. just an example. It's just an example. Ah, I see. I see. That's basically what the NX would do, essentially. From a, from a naming standpoint, is there a reason why we used unmanaged as opposed to native here? Um, mainly because it's unmanaged. But and we already because have of we idea. already have one that's called local unmanaged. Yeah. yeah. That one already does exist, right? Something. Oh, that already exists? Yeah. Yes, I was number that. When did we add that? Is that new too? Uh, I don't remember seeing that one. Maybe I missed it. It was added. Okay. Like, uh, okay. uh, 
it was I did before we we started working on the graphs part. I didn't realize that. So what happens if I load an unmanaged DLL and then I I I see. It's kind of what I was thinking is like it mixes managed and unmanaged with binaries, correct? Like well, there's a set of APIs to deal with the managed assembly binaries, and there's a set of APIs to deal with the unmanaged. I know, I know, but, the, but they are kind of exclusive. You either use this one or that one. Yeah. You never use both. Yeah. Then why do we have this API on the same abstract class? So this 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 class is basically representative of like, of like is, this class is eventually meant to be kind of represent the lifetime of things that you load. Today, we don't support unloading, but the idea is once we have the unloading support for this, you kind of want to is it associate lifetime of a bunch of things with this, and when this goes away, you kind of want to unload all the time. So, so the new name of the class is a little bit too specific, but that's just the if you were designing this API from scratch, you would call it just load context, right? Um, I don't know. I think that's the point, Christoph. Um, the primary purpose is for managed assemblies. That native yeah. assemblies are like a secondary concern for. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I think we always called it load context or assembly load context. So I mean, I'm fine with their names. I mean, but that, that thing already happened, right? It's like a bunny echo, right? Yeah. So, so by the way, like what happens when you have two assembly load contexts and both load uh, the same module from different paths? That's that's fine, I suppose, right? Yeah. yeah. They'll be loaded uh, once, uh, and we'll just have different handles too. Well, if they're the like same. It path, depends if it's from same same path. It depends kind of on the uh, you know uh, underlying platform policy. Let's say if you can load from different paths, but the paths can be linked to the same kind of underlying sure. binary, right? So. No, I was just saying that like what, like what the semantics are when, I guess, whenever somebody has a DLL import interview, they always go through their respective assembly load context, so that you never have this problem of like if somebody, like if there's, there's no ambiguities, basically, that's what I'm trying to get at, so. Yeah, that makes sense. The only like from a naming standpoint would be kind of nice if load and manage load from path would be symmetric to load from assembly path, or so that would probably be called load from path unmanaged DLL, I guess. But that leads like completely shitty, so I don't know. No, no, no it would. It would yeah, it's, load from, it's a good point. It should be load from unmanaged DLL path. Yeah, that's some really that's symmetric. walls of the tongue. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I would prefer we call it something like native, but it's unmanaged deal and it seems wrong to me. But I didn't realize we already had that. I thought we were adding both of these first years when I was looking at this. So what's wrong with unmanaged? I don't know. It just doesn't ring well to me. Uh, yeah, do, do we already have another one that's like Yes, yeah, that's yeah. one. Well, that, that was one already there. That, that I learned, but I thought I did. I thought we were adding both of them. I didn't know that one already existed. Well, <coughs> I wonder whether or not maybe native is better for being potentially renamed both of them. But and what's the default implementation of this method, like the one in the custom assembly context? Is that the default one? Yeah, it does nothing, and it just falls back to kind of the runtime. Is it, if, if, this, if this method returns now, if, if you are overriding yeah, that's why it's now, so slow. That is all right. <laughs> that's the runtime already default. It's like today, if you have if you have if you have the library name in your DL import, uh, that's the result through some built in runtime policy. So if you return now from yeah, the override. Well, I managed to. Yeah. Now, the, the so I don't think we have shipped the contract before in a stable fashion. It's still, so, yeah, still in previous. So if we really felt strongly, we could probably rename it. 
I'm, I'm fine either way. I don't feel strong about this feels. Like no, the only problem with any Mimi, because if you just look at the other APIs that we have in that guy, the only thing that is slightly weird is we yeah, already have sure. this native image thingy here, which is basically for engine images. So mm -hmm. like now we know so what does native mean? Like is this the like it, it, it is something different, right? In that case. So I don't know. I actually don't mind I managed in that context because it so separates clearer. So you see from is always second, like the low. But now we are introducing a new member and from is like second to last. Yeah, we should treat them in this major But we should do it from both, I guess, right? What do you mean both? Yeah, load and manage the other as well, right? Well, no, there's no from and manage the other. There's no from and that. Well, it's the, the, the same as here, right? Like you have load from assembly names, you could have load no, no, from. No, no, they are like two kind of things. Right? There, there's the, there are the virtual methods that you can override, and they yes. don't have the from in it, right? It's the load and load and manage the other. And there's second set of methods that are non-virtual yeah. that you kind of use to implement and that are protected that you use to implement the front methods uh, your, your custom override right and so those guys has, has, has are the old from bar so i load and load so this guy is so for, all the, guys all for all the load from variants for the for assemblies i kind of figured that the load assembly uh, from assembly name was implied in between load and from. I see. So and we, get an analogous portion to that is the unmanaged DLL. So yeah, I thought so. it would make sense to. So basically, these guys here, the load and load unmanaged, are basically the ones that are yeah. virtual. Yeah. The other ones are just helpers. So we could, for instance, say load assembly from stream, but the assembly is implied because it's an assembly load context. But if you want to make it clear we're loading an unmanaged DLL, then maybe it would be load unmanaged DLL from stream. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you were to provide the functionality, yes. Don't you like how the keyword highlighting works here? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's actually a good point. I now understand the pattern. It actually leads there. Yeah. <laughs> so in that case, so we would say we would basically have load I mean, DLL the same as we have, and then we would have another one that is like load from a DLL path. No, because SQL name. Yeah, from is second in all of those because there's a word that is implied after load, and it's assembly. Uh, so. Load matches. This one is called the load unmanaged DLL from path because it's not about the sentence, it's about the unmanaged DLL. Yeah. I guess that makes sense for stream, it doesn't make sense for the first two APIs. It does. If you say load assembly from assembly name or load assembly from assembly path, yeah. or load assembly from native image path. Yes, the second assembly. Sure. Just, yeah. <laughs> if you squint hard, yes. <laughs> it means a lot. Though. Yeah. Load from unmanaged DLL path doesn't mean so. Okay, so the names are fine as is. Basically, that's what I'm taking away yes. from it. Good. Any other feedback? Otherwise, we can call it a day. Yeah. So, you want to look at the details, exceptions, and stuff? Oh, no, like this one. Suppose you were doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have other questions. How do, we, how do we write a general pattern for how people should do a client for that that they have to use? Um, they would typically have to be um, well-known paths, app-specific, um, or specific locations yeah. on the system. Yeah, However, they want to determine that. In general, it's like specific to the app model, right? Like DNX, we have the two people who are the two kind of, uh, users that are actually using this. One is DNX. They, they, they use it to redirect to their DNX, the their DNU. Users. Cache, right? Uh, and the second one is PowerShell, and they have their own scheme how they lay out stuff on this guy. So there you go. Do you want to go on? Yeah. That is their framework around. Or that's the old code, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, but I guess. I think my higher level question is in my library. Mm 
concept of needing to be able to apply policy to the yeah, it's not specific to image, right? It's just once you do that, you 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 provide the policy, right? Yeah. So when you implement, well, like assembly level context, right? I mean, like I'm not sure what you mean by library manager in context. I mean, they I saw a proposal from DNX to do that, but that was I think different from what that thing is. Basically, what this is, this is policy key kind of from oh, time. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you're right. My library manager for them is more about finding uh, it's what the network side is, and then it provides them assembly paths that we don't provide anymore. Yeah, they basically provide structure around their specific implementation of how they find stuff on this. Whereas this one is, as Jan said, they can use it's policy free. So yeah, if you want to provide policy, policy, well, you provide the policy. Sure. And we don't give you anything. In other words, this is like kind of the replacement for up domain. Um, but assembly is all there. So we didn't quite you know, want to expose it on the way it used to be exposed as abdomen assembly is all there. So we didn't want to And I guess in general, there's like three people who implement that type and they all know all payable, I guess. <laughs> I think in the grand scheme of things. Except it's going to be like if I'm a library author writing a graphics library. You shouldn't need to make the idea. Is <coughs> The, for the primary target for this API are the up model providers, yes. like DMX, PowerShell. Yeah, the assumption is that the build system slash the app model takes care of that, right? right so Either the build system copies the bits next to you or links it in and then hooks up to when you actually invoke your DLL import, or you have some runtime where you have, you're still in the NuGet layout and then somebody else figures out where you are on disk and which builds it, which, which is basically what DNX does, yeah. yeah. But the, you know, we don't provide the ability to know where which assembly, like the assembly path anymore in our contracts. Uh, there, you mean assembly dot location? Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be the idea that uh, because once you own the app model and you own the policy, you need to keep keep track of where you, where you load stuff from or some other mechanism to, to actually do it. Because once you once you own your own like app model, so like, every app model needs to basically. I think I don't remember the reason why we removed location, but there were some concerns that it made. It doesn't make any was, sense. I think it was removed because once you're native, you don't have a necessarily location anymore. People, people are using that logic. It wasn't portable in general. Yeah, uh, but I think we removed it way before we had it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. It's not portable. That's the reason. Why. Oh, it was removed in several lives because of like trust issues, probably. That was the original reason why it wasn't there. But yeah. Do we expect people to call this directly that aren't the, the if you did want to load your own library, if you, if you, where you would normally like just p invoke into load library directly because you wanted to do kind of light up kind of things to do text, you expect people to call this on the, in, in the sort of cross platform way issue? And uh, to do that, I think you would also need to kind of expose get from other as that we are not doing here. Right, right. they could, yeah, that's right. We don't have that on the True. Do we want to do that too? Kind of a cross. We need it for others. We need it for others. What's our other story? Yeah. I'm confused. We we don't support native others, correct? No. I mean, why would you need get proc address if you have addons? Well, native addons, that is right. Yeah. I mean, the whole point is that you just. Put the other import in something. And there, that, that's your. We do it from the framework side and for places where we need to run down level and up as well. So we just basically load a library and check for an address of something that exists. We yeah, that's light up. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think get proc address for light up or for detection makes sense. But I think that's orthogonal to a plugin model because plugins are all based on like fixed names, right? Well, I'm going to start to get an entry point. If it's, a, if it's a native, you know, like an added that is a native library. You cannot do that with DLL import, correct? Oh, because you have to know the name. Yeah. Yes. Well, there you know, like, I, I think that it's like unmatched light up things. Like, we <laughs> do need, it's like the kind of the internal feature, right? right? And, you know, as we go with kind of 
evolving in their independent play with MCG, we can apply customizing with the type of MCG to do this kind of flight out, right? Yep. That's what I would hope to. Yeah. What would it look like? You would just basically get you know, bound to an invalid entry point and then it throws an exception. Like what could uh, be let's example? say let's say the MCG would generate code that if you kind of tell it to that is this being is this but the present DL import available. I see. So you basically have two APIs, one that you can call and one that you can just ask whether it's there. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, example. Do we think we're going to do something like that, brother? Because I know right now the deal of port of catching it and the exception around is. Yeah, I think what's is gated. I like we need to get the MCG clean up open source and to be as a you know, like user best and known tool. And once we do that, then we yep. can like open the floodgates for like the customization. Yeah. But what would you do in Corsular? Like in Corsular, the only alternative is that, right? What give people get progress or give people a new attribute where they can basically decide like put an attribute in a method that says this guy should return true if it's there otherwise return false or something right because uh, MCG does make sense for Corsula, right? It yeah. Yes, it does. We, we, want to, we did today like this bunch of internal policy to build into Corsula, right? And we just don't want to make it like more complex. It's sort of the kind of the number of different weeks you can imagine making with it's like you know huge right and you don't want to kind of make it part of the runtime except the moment you make it part of the runtime it's kind of comes with like compatibility guarantees and it's complex to build into the runtime right you kind of want to build it as a separate tool that can that has like more freedom about how it evolves right and and also, that tool should be applicable to all runtimes, not just to CoreCR or just maybe from the same right? So, what you're saying, the fact that CoreCR right now has the interval layer built into something you would like to change in the future and replace it with the same tool that we've used in .NET Native. I mean, yeah, if you go down that path, then sure. Okay. Do we all have right. any other questions on that? I, I don't have any other questions. Uh, I would just mark it as, yep, go for it. Okay. I mean, there was no API feedback. Once we figured out what the right name is. <laughs> was there anything else on the list? Uh, nope. These are the only two things. And uh, I'm actually surprised that we pulled it out. So I only have to find a way to stop the recording once I have my cursor back. Here we go.